Amen. Amen. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're taking a break from our Corinthian study, study of 1 Corinthians. To think today about something that I, I pray it's just it's becoming the, the warp and woof of who we are, who we long to be. How can we honor mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, godly women? Well, I think one of the ways we can do this is testify to their tireless efforts at disciple-making and also challenge and exhort one another to this. The Scripture sees moms as fulfilling their highest calling when they seize the privilege of children and pour themselves into them as disciple-makers. Children, I want to say to you this. You have a mom who loves the Lord. Her highest desire is to see you come to confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then grow as a follower of Christ and yourself make an impact for Christ on the lives of others. 2 Timothy 1, 3 to 7 is where we're reading this morning. Stand with me if you would. hope you found this passage in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put the text on the screen for you. I want you to see the Word. We do some things here. A lot of things we do very intentionally in our worship. One of the things we do when we read responsively is to be sure that you're seeing the Word, you're saying the Word. It's important for all of our senses to take it in. So I want you to, to gaze upon the Word. Follow along as I read this passage. It's Paul writing to young Timothy, who was key, critical to Paul's ministry. We'll see in a moment how. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit Not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we take it to heart today. Those here who are moms, moms moms-to-be, wanting to be moms one day, grandmas, great-grandmas, take it to heart and purpose to renew and recommit to the most noble task God has given you. Those of us who are not and never will be, May we commit to be sure that we're encouraging this and don't do anything to hinder it in the precious, godly women who are in our lives. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, when we approach this day every year, there's, I have a lot of emotions I go through. One is where uh, it's hard for me to believe, but my, my own mother has uh, been home with the Lord for almost 23 years now. It's hard to believe she's been gone that long. Another is that when we prepare to celebrate motherhood and exhort moms and and grandmas and great-grandmas, I also know that we need to feel tender for for hurting women. We need to be sure that we don't somehow send a message that says a woman's incomplete if she's not a mother. That's nothing is farther from the truth. I've told you this is probably my 13th message to you as your pastor on, on this day, this Mother's Day. And I've told you through the years about my godly aunt, Nanny, we called her who never had any children, and yet she was a mother to multitudes. And I even met some. She was in Arkansas. I met some in Shreveport years ago. It blew my mind. So we don't want to to send the wrong message. I know also that there are women who, who are struggling. 
They're mourning a loss this year. They're, they're feeling hurt, feeling left out, feeling like failures. And, and I want us to be sensitive to that, that we not miss the boat and wound precious women who should find the safest place in life in the midst of the congregation of the Lord's people. Women who suffered miscarriages, who have wayward children, women who were orphans themselves, grieving the loss of their own mom, mourning the loss of a child. There's great cause today to be encouraged. We sang about it. Thank you, Joshua, for the, for the song list. We sang about it. No matter how shaky your knees may be for whatever reason in your life right now, we stand on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ if we're saved by grace through faith. No, no matter what the complexities of life are throwing at you, there's this powerful, simple truth. Yes, Jesus loves me. He loves even me. And we don't have to figure out how to find the grace of God. God has made sure in and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that his grace will find us if we will simply drop where we are and repent and cry out for mercy. He always meets with mercy, those who cry out for his mercy. So I want us to, on this Mother's Day, to celebrate again the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, to bless I want you to see in this passage just four, four things briefly as we're thinking about mothers as disciple makers. I want you to see, first of all, the gospel fruit of a mother's disciple making efforts in verses three and four. The godly faithfulness of a mother's disciple making efforts. Then the gracious flame of a mother's disciple making efforts. And finally, the glorious force of a mother's disciple-making efforts. First of all, this, this gospel fruit of a mother's disciple-making efforts. You would think preaching through this, we would, we would talk about the, the, the matter and then end with the fruit. Paul, in greeting Timothy, <laughs> begins with the fruit. He says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors. So there's, there's a reason Paul comes to cite the grandmother Lois and the mother Eunice, he's thinking about that in his own mind. As did my ancestors. I thank God that I, I serve him with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. If you know anything about the ministry of the Apostle Paul, his journey in Christ, as he met many along the way and, and saw many people confess faith in Christ and, and join him in the, in the service of the Lord, in the mission effort, that he, he lost many companions. There was, there was a time in his life where he could say, and, and no one has, has stayed with me. Listen to what he says about Timothy, though, this young disciple. Think about Paul's letters. Half the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. Two of the books we have are written to one fellow. Timothy. What an impact Timothy made on Paul's life. I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. We've studied through the pastoral epistles here, First and Second Timothy and Titus, years ago, and we looked at, at that relationship that Paul had with him, how he had confidence in him. He entrusted him to go back around to the churches that Paul had founded and to establish them further, to strengthen them in the faith, the church at Ephesus being one of the, one of the key ones. But hear what he says. I want you to think about this. I ask myself this. I ask you this. Who would say this? I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. When I pray in the morning, I thank God for you, Timothy. When I pray at night, I thank God for you, Timothy. He goes on and says, as I remember your tears. Timothy had a heart like the Apostle Paul. He had a heart for God. He had a heart for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, did, he was one of these people that thought he could follow Christ and leave the church out of the matter. No, he had a heart. For, he loved what Jesus loved. He had a heart for souls. Paul says, I remember your tears. And he's not remembering them there as a sign of weakness in Timothy's life. He is remembering them because it is a sign of connection. 
Christianity was no mental gymnastics with Timothy. God captured his mind. He captured his heart. He says, I remember your tears. I long to see you. Paul was busy. He burned himself out for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel. He traveled the known world planting churches. But he had a longing in his heart to see Timothy. And there was a vested interest he had. Paul had a lot of sorrows. He was stoned, we, we think, to death <laughs> and, and resuscitated. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was snake bitten. He was hunted like an animal by his, by his fellow Pharisees who took an oath that they would not eat again until they saw him dead. But notice what communion with Timothy gives him. I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. See, Timothy was not to Paul one of those people that when Paul saw coming, he went, oh, my goodness. No, no. He, lo he loved Timothy. And, and why is that? What, what is there? It is the fruit of... It is the fruit of the gospel labors of his mom and his grandmother. We see that in the second point. The godly faithfulness of a mother's disciple-making efforts. He says, I'm reminded when I pray for you in the morning and I pray for you at night and I, and I remember that you're, you weep over souls like I do, you, you grieve for the lost, you grieve for the church, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. That yours is not a false faith. It's not a demon faith. James says, you say you have faith. Well, the demons believe and tremble. It's not, just, it's not speculation. It's not just head knowledge. I'm, your sincere faith. It's true. It's genuine. Paul would write to the Thessalonians, pray for us. There are those who long to harm us, for not all have faith. And he wasn't just talking about those outright pagans who rejected the gospel. He's talking about people who professed to have faith and turned on him, sold him out. Timothy's faith was sincere. What does Paul connect it to, though? Notice. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Ladies, is there a greater gift you can give to your children than to impart? Hear me now. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. To impart by example and by teaching, saving faith. We know that only the Lord can save someone. Look at the context in which Timothy was raised. And think, brothers and sisters, the gospel is young when Paul is writing this. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is young in terms of its advancement. And yet Timothy had the blessed privilege under God of having a grandmother who came to faith in Christ. And a mother who came to faith in Christ. So that he, he would see sincere faith. I had such a mother. My children had such a grandmother. My children have such a mother. My grandchildren have such a grandmother. When I preached my mother's funeral in December of 1994, a lot of people came because she touched a lot of people. But I told them, I said, if you're, you're, you're not here, surely, because you think Marzell Askell was somehow cut out of different cloth, that she was, a, that there was something innate in her that made her special like she was. I said, I hope you're not here for that. Because what 
blessed you in my mother's life was that which was the fruit of the grace of God in her life. That's what makes a lasting impact, ladies. We teach our kids a lot of things, and you do. I mean, think about it. You, you're the ones who, before they ever see a teacher, you're the ones who teach them to read. They learn to speak living around you. They learn to eat. They learn to clothe themselves. Think of all the things you teach them. It's, it's remarkable that by the time a child is four years old, their brain has absorbed more than 75% of what they will learn their entire lives. And those days, they're with you. Those months, those years, they're with you. You're the one that imprints them. Just as surely as a duckling is imprinted by a mother duck. It's that season in the neighborhoods. You're seeing them, aren't you? We have ducks that come around, and, and there they go. You should watch them. Mama duck's going. Daddy duck's kind of standing wondering, what do I do now? Mama duck's. And the little ducklings, they're just following. They're following. Timothy had that. Paul would say to him later in this same letter in chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. There's that sincere faith. See, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a wishy-washy. Firmly believed. Knowing that from whom you learned it. <laughs> this is two chapters over. He learned it from Lois, his grandma. He learned it from Eunice, his mother. I had a dad. Uh, my dad was a deacon, Sunday school teacher, drunkard, womanizer. My mother was a disciple maker. A disciple maker. Before, before that term was bandied around. Before it was cool to be missional, my mother was on a mission. to raise the children God gave her in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Even though she was in her 40s when she had me and the doctors told her it was a high-risk pregnancy and he wasn't quite sure about the wisdom of it. And when she, had, when she was pregnant with my brother, who's four to five years younger than me, they suggested an abortion. She was a mother, a disciple maker. That was Timothy's legacy. He said, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. You see, when grandma and mom gave him lessons, they weren't just life lessons from common wisdom. No. And all they had at this time, by the way, brothers and sisters, was the Old Testament. But he was taught the Old Testament. They read to him from the Old Testament scriptures and showed him how they talked about a Savior who had come. These sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation, not just wisdom, but saving wisdom, wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's at that point, it's in the light of who Timothy was raised by and the impact that grandma and mom had on his life that Paul makes this powerful statement that all Scripture is God-breathed. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. In order that, there's the purpose of it, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And Timothy was equipped by grandma and by mama. His disciple-making grandma discipled his mama. And together they discipled him. And he is the one to whom Paul says, the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these same things communicate to faithful men who will be able to instruct others also. And Timothy did that. Timothy was a disciple maker. Now, brothers and sisters, Grandma Lois made a tremendous impact on first century Christianity. 
And so did Timothy's mama. You see, Paul says, I'm convinced that your grandmother's faith was sincere, your mother's faith was sincere, and I believe that you have, by grace, by God's grace, taking their faithful teaching and saving your soul, that you have a sincere faith as well. There's a word I was talking to uh, one of our families the other day. The first time I saw it, I thought it was a Catholic term, catechism. I thought, catechism? I'm a Baptist, man. We don't do catechism. Then I found out just how stupid I was. That's, it's a Greek word, katecheo, which simply means to instruct. And it pops up in the, in, the, uh, in the Greek New Testament from time to time. just want to cite some just real quickly for you. See, Timothy was catechized. <laughs> We encourage you here to catechize. We passed out a couple of Mother's Days ago a disciple-making tool for families. If you need another one, if you've lost it, don't feel bad. Don't feel sheepish. Don't think the pastor's going to scold you. No, if you've lost it, come get another one from me because it's a critical tool for you as parents to be disciple-makers of your children. We have them available for you. Look at Luke 1, 3, and 4. Luke's writing to, to Theophilus. He's telling him this account of what Jesus began to do and to teach. And he says in verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have, certain, have certainty concerning the things you have been catechized in. That's the word. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19, we'll get to this as we're studying through 1 Corinthians. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to catechize others than 10,000 words in a tongue. In Galatians 6, 6, Paul writes to the churches in, in the province of Galatia, let the one who is catechized in the word share all good things with the one who catechizes. Boys and girls... Young men and women, you have an opportunity today to share good things with one who has catechized you, who's instructed you in the Word. I have a book in my library. It's an old, old book uh, entitled In Royal Service. Some of you ladies will remember that was, that's, that was the name of the magazine for the Women's Missionary Union, Southern Baptist Convention. There was a book by, by Fanny. I don't know why would people name their Fanny Exile Scudder. Married name Heck. I don't know what you're, what are you thinking when you name your child middle name Exile? I wanted to know about the Jews or the Babylonian cap. I just don't know. But anyway, that's her name. And she tells about Dr. Richard Furman. She, in this book, she's talking about who was pastor at First Baptist Church, Charleston, South Carolina. She says he was a great believer in children. Let one of his child friends tell you the story she long afterward told to her grandchildren. This is a person who, who's now a grandmother who writes reflecting upon the ministry at First Baptist Church of Charleston, South Carolina. We had no Sabbath school then, but we had the Baptist Catechism with which we were as familiar as with the Lord's Prayer. At our quarterly seasons, the quarterly meetings, they would have, we children of the congregation repeated the Baptist Catechism standing in a circle around the front, we numbered from 60 to 100, the girls standing at the south of the pulpit, the boys meeting them in the center as they stood on the north side of the pulpit. Dr. Furman Wood, in his majestic, winning manner, walked down the pulpit steps and with book in hand, commenced asking questions, beginning with the little ones, very small indeed some were, but well taught and drilled at home. We had to memorize the whole book, the whole catechism. For none knew which questions would fall to them. I think I hear at this very moment the dear voice of our pastor saying, A little louder, my child. And the trembling sweet voice would be raised a little too loud. It was a marvel to visitors on these occasions, the wonderful self-possession and accuracy manifested by the whole class. This practice was of incalculable benefit. What's the practice? Drilling in front of the church? No being taught at home, was of incalculable benefit. For when it pleased God to change our hearts, and when offering ourselves to the church for membership, we knew what the church doctrines meant and were quite familiar with answering questions before the whole congregation and did not quake 
When pastor or deacon or anyone else asked what we understood by baptism, the Lord's Supper, justification, adoption, sanctification. Oh, no. We've been well taught at home. Brothers and sisters, if the only time your children are getting instructions is the 30 to 45 minutes they have on Sunday morning in Sunday school, tremble and weep. You don't have to fly by the seat of your pants. We have a tool. It's been used historically. This woman's talking about it here. And she's telling her grandchildren about it when she writes this. And then she adds, as with a deep sigh, what a pity that such a course of instruction has been abandoned. The godly faithfulness of women who take seriously the instruction of children placed in their charge by the Lord. Third, the gracious flame of a mother's disciple-making efforts. Paul says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He's talking about when he set Timothy apart for the gospel ministry. But you see, there's no setting apart for the gospel ministry if the flame of the gospel has not been stirred there. And if, if moms and grandmas have not breathed upon it and been helped by the Holy Spirit who breathes life into it. That's what he's talking about there. Fan it into flame. Fan into flame. Cultivate it. Moms and dads, grandmas, there's not anything to fan into flame if you're not piling the wood on the altar of the children God's given you. Fourth, the glorious force of a mother's disciple-making efforts. Here it is. Paul says, four, God gave us a spirit not of fear. You want your children to grow up fearing what men can do to them? Fearing what's going to happen. He gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power. Do not miss is the word there. We're raising little sticks of dynamite. My prayer is that when they come to confess Christ as Lord and God strategically places them, that they will blow to kingdom come the wickedness of this present age and that gospel blessedness will rain down upon the ashes. of love. It's easy to be hateful. Goodness gracious, people are hateful. God gives us a spirit of love. Timothy saw it in grandma. He saw it in mama. God brought Paul into his life. He saw it in Paul. Spirit of love and self-control. I'll tell you something, there's very little self-control today. Our founding fathers believed that this country could only survive if, if the children were taught to have self-control, to harness themselves in. And we're seeing a generation completely out of control. How are you going to counter it? There's only one tool God has given us to counter it, and that's the children he's given us to raise them as disciples who are disciple makers and to speak truth into the darkness the stygian darkness of this culture. It's the only hope. Well, the gospel is the only hope of the world, Pastor. That's right. But the gospel doesn't come in ethereal ways. It doesn't come from contemplating your navel. It comes as people speak the gospel and live the gospel in front of a culture that knows nothing of the gospel or what they know they hate. And that doesn't fall to the schools to accomplish that. That doesn't even fall to Sunday school. Thank God for our Sunday school teachers. It falls in the home. And moms are the first line. Moms, some of you may be thinking, man, I'm a failure. No, you're not a failure. Don't give up. Keep praying. Some of us have raised children. In fact, all my children are adults now. They're still my children. I'm still praying, praying for one that she'll find her way. It'd be easy for me. The devil beats me up around the head and, and, and gets a hold of my wife every now and then and says, well, y'all are failures. So you know, no, Jesus hadn't had the last word. I feel like a failure sometimes. But he hadn't had the last word. Pray God, honor. We, we've had to start going back and piling the wood again on the altar, piling the wood on the altar, praying, praying, praying. Oh, Lord, set it on fire. While you have the children under your control, though, teach them. 
Breathe upon them the Word of God, the truth of God. Hear them pray for you, for their souls. Hear them pray. Hear them, let them hear you pray for their souls. Put them under the preaching of the gospel. It's, it's hypocrisy. It's an insult to God to say, Lord, save my kids, and then you take them off somewhere else, anywhere else except here. That's an insult to God. He gave Christ for the church. He didn't give Jesus Christ for your family. You need to wake up and realize that. He gave Christ for the church. And the hope you have is to put your family where the wind blows. That's the hope you have. And the wind blows when the people of God meet. Let me close you with this. You've heard this saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I did not know that was a poem. Listen to this. Blessings on the hand of women. Angels guard its strength and grace. In the palace, cottage, hovel, oh, no matter where the place. Would that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curl. He's describing, wouldn't it be great if, if life was just roses at home? <laughs> For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infancy's the tender fountain. Power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlets. From them souls unresting grow. Grow on for the good or evil. Sunshine streamed or evil hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission. Here upon our natal sod. Keep, O oh, keep the young heart open always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled. They're cultivated like in an oyster. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women. Fathers, sons, daughters cry. The sacred song is mingled with worship in the sky. Mingles where no tempest darkens. Rainbows evermore are hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. What legacy will you leave, dear ladies? Will you be disciple makers? See, you are disciple makers. If God gave you those children, you're disciple makers. If he's given you the grandchildren, you're disciple makers. Great-grandchildren, you're disciple makers. What will you make of them? That's the question. What will be the legacy? What will be the impact? My prayer is that we will encourage you here to be all God intends for you to be and that you will raise a generation that will speak truth to a generation in this country that's as lost as any generation has ever been in the history of this country. And yet, the gospel is as powerful today as it was the day that Grandma and Mama spoke it to Timothy. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father,